Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of Painting Our Feelings. Today, I'm feeling a bit blue, and that's okay. We all feel a bit blue sometimes. And the way I see it, what better thing to paint on such a day than the big blue itself, the ocean. But even the ocean can be scary at times. Imagine if you were someplace stark, alone, someplace where you had the very real possibility of being the first human to have visited, ever. And you saw something horrible, something maddening, something impossible, something so haunting it drives you to madness and beyond. <sighs> if you think about it, that's exactly what sailors had to deal with back in the olden days, you know? Being at seas of black in the pitch of night, a void of stars above and enigmatic depths below. I mean, that coupled with being away from civilization for so long, your brain is bound to conjure up some terribly surreal things. I mean, it's no wonder how their poor, tortured brains came up with sirens, krakens, merfolk, um, sea gods, and stories about albatross. And trust me, you'd go mad too if you were locked away from the world, forced to live with a gang of drunk, hairy, smelly, burly, sweaty, sex- uh, probably criminals, with thundering waves crashing against and over the walls of your only home. The only thing standing between you and the untold depths below. Eh, people back then were such pansies. I mean, how scary can a big puddle of water be? <laughs> I want you to just close your eyes and picture in your head a video game. Just the first one that comes to mind. It could be Zelda, it could be Call of Duty, it could even be something scary like Outlast. Chances are you're picturing a game that includes the sun shining down on you, whether it has a day-night cycle or in the case of a horror game, maybe it shines on you just after you've escaped whatever horrific nightmare you fell into. There are those games, and then there's Sunless Sea. In Sunless Sea, you take control of a ship captain sailing the Undersea. Like its name suggests, it's a sea that's under. See, unlike the seven seas we know of, the Undersea exists way below the bowels of the earth in an impossibly large cave system called the Neath because it's beneath, y you get it. Rich with its own biology, lore, physics, and even gods, none of which exist in the overworld. The gameplay here consists of going from the main hub of fallen London to the different ports scattered throughout the map. At first you start off just visiting ports and making reports, and then bringing them back to fallen London so you can sell them to the Admiralty for coin. You see, information is very valuable in the Neath. Throughout your travels you'll come across strategic information, vital intelligence, secrets, even moves in the great political game of the Neath. Physically, these may not be more than just informative scribbles on damp paper, but depending on how rare the information is, these scraps of info can be some of the most expensive goods you can peddle in your career, especially when you take into account certain uh, more dangerous pieces of information which may prove to be very profitable if you're willing to take a few risks. Everything from tales of terror, searing enigmas, extraordinary implications, reports of far-off ports like King Eater's Castle, even visions of the surface. You'll have to go through hoops and hurdles to get some of these because of how inscrutable the undersea can be. There are always creatures roaming about that would love nothing more than to make a meal out of you, or at least some of your crew. Giant crabs, blue prophets, whatever those are, giant sentient icebergs, some things that only appear when your sanity is low and follow you without pause, and other things which I can't make heads or tail of no matter how hard I try. It's not just the waters of the undersea you need to watch out for, however, as the ports are often just as enigmatic, maybe even more, the Neath is funny in that way. You'll come across and take part in strange rituals, wars between rats and guinea pigs, a town built upon the maw of a leviathan, another town filled with the dead, or at least the dying. Hello there, smooth skin. There are also some things around the undersea that are hardly explained at all. The undersea is not a nice place to be, and the further you sail into the Z, the stranger things get and the more your terimeter rises. This must be what sailors felt like back in the day. Maybe it was sea madness that had sailors coming back to port rambling about having escaped a kraken or having almost caught a fish this big. Or maybe they really did see something out there. Funnily enough, in the Neath, there are literal demons. And you have a hard time putting your thoughts to paper when writing the port report. Then when you go to hand it in, the paper is somehow blank and people believe you because of how strange things get out at Z. 
But when you tell them about the rad versus guinea pig war, they just laugh and call you Captain Whiskers. One of the greatest mysteries of the Neath comes not from Sunless Sea, but actually its predecessor Fallen London. An online text-based game, Fallen London plays much like Sunless Sea does, except without having a video game UI implemented. After all, it is text-based. In Fallen London, you play through character storylines, level up your character's mini attributes, and delve deeper into the eccentricities of the Neath. After you've leveled your character enough and seen a ton of what Fallen London has to offer, you'll be able to gumshoe your way into the story of Mr. Eaton. Stories of the Z are filled with the unknown. Even in well-charted waters, you'll never really know what lies beyond the distant fog until you reach it yourself. It's all about chasing a thread of mystery without knowing what can possibly come out in the end. You could finish a storyline, you could get some goodies, or maybe you could discover something that shouldn't be discovered, but at the end of it, at least you come out of it with something. So in a way, it's worth it, right? In Fallen London, seeking Mr. Eaton's name is something more. It's a simple question in a setting filled with them. Who or what is Mr. Eaton? According to the wiki, Mr. Eaton is an ancient, mysterious emptiness. A voice, a hunger. But what does any of that actually mean? Is he even a he? Is it human at all? Is it even an it? To seek Mr. Eaton's name is to follow a path of loss, depravity, and regret. This quest will cost you 30 whole levels of your stats, all of your lodgings, thousands of appalling secrets. It will make you a criminal, it'll take lives, your daughter or a goat? Tons of searing enigmas, time, and the fallen London character in your account. Keep in mind that in real time, this will take many months of your life for you to reach a point where your character can even attempt to seek Mr. Eaton's name. It may not seem like it because I bet you've never even heard of Fallen London before, but seeking Mr. Eaton's name is one of the most convoluted mysteries in all of gaming. It's so secretive in fact that the creators have politely asked for the story to not be spoiled anywhere on the internet. You can look this up yourself and you won't find much on the matter. Even then, if you do find something, to know is one thing, but to understand who or what Mr. Eaton used to be, you'll have to spend those many months in Fallen London. Building your character up just to lose it all in vain, all for a small scrap of information. <sighs> so we have it. It's Mr. Eaton. Or at least Mr. Eats a lot. Get it? Might as well be a picture of me, you fat thing. Well, let's start a new one. Maybe I'll burn enough calories painting to allow myself to eat a burger this month. I am a surgeon! I am a surgeon! The act of dredging is to bring objects out of the seabed by use of a dredge. In Dredge, the most recent nautical adventure I'll feature here, you do a lot of dredging by use of a dredge. I like the word dredge. Amicable nouns aside, you'll actually be doing more fishing in this one than actually dredging. At first, you'll start by sailing and fishing right out of port and then returning to sell your fish so you can upgrade your gear and buy better stuff. For how repetitive this sounds, I mean it sounds like a Roblox tycoon game. It's actually really fun. And most of that fun comes from moving on up in the world to the point where you can venture out further and further and see new horizons, new ports, and new fish. Even the fishing minigame rarely gets old because it changes slightly depending on what type of fish you're after. The dredging minigame though... I did get tired of that, real quick. I mean, for being the name of the game, I just expected a little bit more. Now, being a seafaring game with horror elements, unsurprisingly, this one plays a lot like Sunless Sea does, and it even features more than a couple of references to the Neath. Whether this is done on purpose or not isn't clear to me, at least nothing concrete that I could find. Sunless Sea is cool and all, and I am a huge fan, but I feel like the trailer for that game was a little deceptive and downplays the fact that it's essentially a visual novel as the coolest stuff in the game all happens in text windows and with stat-influenced dice rolls. Those aren't necessarily bad things, but it just wasn't what I was expecting or hoping for when I bought it. This isn't a problem anyone is likely to have with dredge though. Dredging? Check. Fishing? Check. Weird ungodly fishing anomalies? Double check. Eldritch horrors in almost every port you visit? Yes! Apart from the starting area of the Marrows, looking back on it now, what a... interesting name for a starting area? 
very telling for the rest of the game. Anyways, after getting enough money to buy a better engine and hopefully better lights so the nighttime horrors don't scare your little socks off, you can take yourself to the other areas in any order your little heart desires. None of them friendly by the way. Welcome to the Dredge 5 Star Cruise Tour where you can see the sights, such as the Gale Cliffs, which has some sort of sea serpent hidden within the crevices veiled from the rest of the world, the Stellar Basin, a beautiful coastal paradise with some sort of sea monster in the center, in case you haven't noticed, that's a bit of a theme here. The Twisted Strand, a mangrove bayou, almost a jungle with tight shallow rivers instead of the open sea you'd be used to by now. Also, there are sea monsters, but maybe these are more alien monsters? And lastly, the Devil's Spine, a volcanic miasma of heat littered with mysterious ruins and some very strange NPCs. And, um, uh, yeah, another sea monster. The story itself is divided into two parts. The main story is confined to esoteric messages in bottles, uh, literally messages in bottles, that you just find out in the ocean, which you'll have to piece together yourself, and the collector, a mysterious skinty queen who tasks you with going to the four aforementioned areas and getting a special trinket from each, which you later turn into him in exchange for one of the magical powers which actually really help, especially haste. God, that one helps you through the entire game. So, you turn them all into him, and then there you have it, game over, yay. Pretty cool, but it doesn't compare to the second part of the story of Dredge. Not the story of some skinty mother, no matter how handsome he dresses, but the story of the world itself. You see, to get these trinkets, you'll need to travel to the four corners of the map. The Gale Cliffs, Stellar Bay, uh, all four of them. And you already know all four of them have something extra spoopy going on with them. Uh, let's revisit them, shall we? The Gale Cliffs, an ancient meeting place for pirates, now home to pretty much no one, as most of the residents, the recent- <laughs> Wait, what? As the most recent residents, the whalers all left after they awoke something within the cliffs themselves. And now they live on the nearby town of Ingfell. The Stellar Basin, a once popular tourist destination, now abandoned by everyone except for volatile jellyfish and a curious researcher who studies them. Even the researcher had to flee, however, as something in the center of the basin slowly found its way up to the surface, terrorizing anything that dared swim or sail near it. Now, the researcher can be found just off the basin in an abandoned old fort with her dog. Through her quest, you can fix up a machine she was working on that suppresses the ancient creature, if just for a few hours. The Twisted Strand, a jungle of mangrove once teeming with life, now seems to have a mind of its own. As the roots twist and close paths, making the winding mess of river even more confusing. For some unknown reason, the area is the only one in the game which has a high concentration of fallen aircraft. In fact, it's the only area in the game with any aircraft at all. It's also the makeshift home of the airman, the last surviving soldier of the Rex. He and the creatures that claimed his comrades' lives, of course. The Devil's Spine. Arguably the most mysterious area of the game, the Devil's Spine holds the oldest land masses in this world as well as mysterious ruins, the history of which have been completely lost to time. There's also an enigmatic old lighthouse towering over the one you saw when you first started your adventure, and the crazed fanatic who wants you to find three flames of the deep so he can... Uh, I still don't know exactly what he does with them. You know what, I still don't know exactly what happens to him. The monster for this area is a brood of diabolical fish who swarm your ship slowing you and alerting their blind mother to bring you to the depths. I, I think I need to lie down after that sentence. And that's Dredge. I can see the game getting a bit repetitive for some, but for a short little game that could, if you really wanted to, be finished in just a day, it's pretty fun and compelling, as you always want to see what every island and every dock has to offer. This will keep you entertained for a good 5-10 to 10 hours for a casual playthrough, and what more can you ask for an indie game nowadays as long as the price is right? Wait, it's how much? Uh, uh... Get it on sale, get it on sale. Dredge, 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 dredge. What a funny word. <sighs> Another masterpiece. It's a lighthouse. Get it? <sighs> Look, man, I kind of ran out of ideas on that one. Let's just nod our heads and move on. The Lighthouse is a 2019 film starring Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Yeah, that Robert Pattinson. From here on, there will be heavy spoilers for the movie, so in case you haven't yet, I promise you'll regret not watching it first. 
If anything, The Lighthouse does two things very well. One, it's filmed in such a way that every shot has either really beautiful composition, plays with your emotions, advances the plot, or somehow it does all three at once. And second, unlike most of the generic brain-dead horror movies that come out around October, oh my God! this one doesn't have any boring scenes you have to force yourself through to get to the good parts. Matter of fact, I had a bad dream last night myself. I had a heart on this morning when I woke up, Tina, and your name written all over it. You need Jesus! These two things do wonders on your second or even third viewing of the movie, because even knowing the events that are about to unfold doesn't make the movie feel like you're sitting through the same thing. Instead, your knowledge of the plot can change the context of certain shots and conversations. Putting it shrimply, the whole plot can be summed up as two guys on a rock doing chores. The old lighthouse keeper Thomas and the young wiki Ephraim. It's clear right off the bat that they're both hiding things. Thomas physically keeps things behind the lock and key. The light in the lighthouse, the cupboard in the bedroom which shelters his journal. While Ephraim closes himself off emotionally, to the point where he almost expected to spend the entire four weeks they're enlisted for in complete silence. I ain't much for talking. On someone's first watch, this may just seem like nothing more than character development, but on the second, you understand why they act that way. In fact, Thomas, the more experienced seaman, <laughs> knows not to pry into people's secrets. He may be secretive in his own right, but he's never the one that pries into the other's business. On the contrary, he seems to shut down whenever Ephraim gets too drunk and runs his mouth a little too much. Like when he reveals that his real name isn't even Ephraim. Even though it's kind of a bombshell of information, Thomas just kind of accepts it and tries to go back to business as usual without prying further. With his experience, Thomas knows how dangerous it could be to pry into mysteries deep out at sea. Especially prying into secret names hidden on purpose. It's revealed here that Ephraim's name is also Thomas, but for the sake of not getting confusing here, I'm still gonna call him Ephraim. Eventually, Ephraim gets even more drunk, of course, and confesses that the reason for his name change is that in his past employment as a logger, his foreman got into an accident right in front of him and he just watched, letting him die in cold blood. And it's actually his foreman that was called Ephraim. Thomas learning Ephraim's real name was one thing, but understanding why he adopted this persona eventually cost Thomas everything. <laughs> Although he didn't even ask, to be fair. I mean, he really didn't want to know. In truth, the whole film is like this, filled with unknowns. What is up with the mermaid fetish, and the actual mermaid that only Ephraim seems to see or hear? What's up with the light in the lighthouse? What's up with Thomas himself? Going back to what I said before, on my first watch of this movie, I saw it through Ephraim's eyes, as the movie does follow him around for the most part. But later on, you stop trusting him as a clear window into this world as little discrepancies keep coming up. Like after he starts drinking heavily, weeks will pass from scene to scene, while for Ephraim and us, the audience, it felt like seconds. And another comes up after Ephraim starts to go mad <laughs> and runs from an axe wielding Thomas. Because according to him, it was Ephraim who was the one chasing after Thomas with an axe. On my second watch, I came up with this theory that at certain points like these, the narrative actually changes from Ephraim to Thomas. And if you think about it, Thomas must be going through the same rigmarole as well. And if Ephraim can't be trusted with something as simple as being conscious for an undisclosed amount of time, who's to say he can be trusted with his view of Thomas? Or what he saw in the lighthouse? Maybe there wasn't even a mermaid at all, and what he finds in the end is just a figment of his imagination. Okay. I'm going for a scuttle. <sighs> that concludes not only our view into the ocean and its many mysteries, but our final piece. And there. Oh my god, it's beautiful. Astounding. Impossibly perfect. Every brushstroke, every gradient, every chosen color. 